We're pleased today to have with us uh, Judge John Gerard. Judge Gerard currently serves as a United States District Court Judge for the United States District of Nebraska. Prior to his service, uh, he as Judge Gerard, he was Justice Gerard. Spent 17 years on the Supreme Court. Uh, Judge Gerard graduated from Nebraska Wesleyan some years ago. We won't say when. <laughs> And he went on to earn an MPA at the University of Arizona and took a law degree from the University of the Pacific. And prior to his time on the bench, he was in private practice in Norfolk and also served as the city attorney for Battle Creek. Judge Gerard, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I was also a probation officer in between, so for some of you that are taking uh, Criminology uh, 101, I can talk to you uh, about that. I, I went to Nebraska Wesleyan uh, and graduated back in 1976. I will uh, reveal that. And then I went to the University of Arizona uh, and got a master's degree in uh, public administration and corrections at that time. I was going to be a probation officer and, and was a probation officer uh, up in Norfolk and uh, Northeast Nebraska. Did that for a couple years before I went back to, to law school. Um, went to law school out in California and then came back to the uh, Midwest and I practiced law with uh, Dave Domina. It was uh, Domina, Gerard, Koppel, and Stratton back in uh, from 1981 until 1995 and at that time I was appointed to the Nebraska Supreme Court and I served there for some 16 and a half years or so and then I was uh, nominated and confirmed to the United States uh, Federal District Bench um, back in 2012, nominated in 2011, and uh, have been serving since 2012. So I took kind of an unusual path. I, uh, oftentimes you go from the trial court bench to the appellate court bench, and I went from a state appellate court bench uh, back to the trial court bench because I wanted to. Uh, I, I wanted to, A, be a, a federal judge, and... Uh, B, I missed being in the trial court. The, uh, the lonely halls of the, uh, of the appellate court, I, I had had enough of that for about 16 and a half years. So now I'm back dealing with, with juries and, uh, and lawyers on a day-to-day -day basis in the uh, federal system. So uh, thank you for coming in from this beautiful weather uh, over the noon hour. I'll visit with you for, for a little bit. Uh, I am going to modify uh, Professor Eskridge's uh, instructions by a little bit. I, I'm going to talk to you about two or three different areas, and at each of the ends of those areas, uh, I will take questions. Um, I'll ask if you have any questions during uh, during those areas, and then we'll we'll move on to a uh, to a separate section. So, um, what I was uh, what I was asked to speak on was the uh, state of the federal judiciary. So, uh, I'm going to talk about two or three different areas. Uh, First of all, I'm going to talk about the state of the federal judiciary in relation to other branches. So I'll be talking about the federal judiciary in a broad sense. We can talk about the U.S. Supreme Court and nominations of judges and things like that. So I'll, I'll talk about the federal judiciary in general. Then I'll talk about the current state of the Nebraska federal judiciary, what, what's going on here in the, uh, in the state of Nebraska. Uh, and then last, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I see in the immediate future. Are there changes with a uh, new administration or a new attorney general? What, uh, what types of things might, might we anticipate uh, or see? So we will uh, we'll get started. Uh, first, I'll talk to you about the federal judiciary uh, overall um, and the importance of an independent uh, judiciary. Uh, as you have different judges come speak with you, I think you had uh, Chief Justice Mike Haviken, who's a friend of mine and uh, is the Chief Justice of the Nebraska State Supreme Court. He spoke to you, uh, um, I guess, earlier this year or during the first semester. Um, there are differences between the state court and the federal court and how uh, judges are appointed. Uh, and I think that's important to, uh, to know. Um, under Article 3, Section 1 of the United States Constitution, uh, federal uh, judicial judges have a lifetime appointment. Okay? And that was significantly debated back in the late uh, 
1780s as far as whether uh, federal judges uh, should have uh, lifetime appointments or whether there should be term limits of some sort. And you may see in the newspapers both recently and in the future that that debate uh, goes on. Um, James Madison won that debate, uh, won that, uh, that portion of the debate for federal judges. Madison thought it was important for uh, judges to be uh, basically autonomous uh, moral agents. In, in other words, they should be independent of ideolo ideology. In other words, it doesn't matter which president appointed you or what your background was or whether you were a, uh, a Democrat or a Republican or an independent or, or anything in between. Uh, when you take the federal bench, uh, you should be an independent agent, uh, essentially. Okay, that's number one. I mean, and, and James Madison felt strongly about that. Um, but secondly, he recognized that judges were human, okay? Uh, and in the state courts, you'll see judges are oftentimes guided. In other words, if you have a, a major murder case in, uh, in say, Kearney, Nebraska, or, or Norfolk, Nebraska, and there is a lot of public pressure uh, can be placed on you to impose uh, a death penalty versus life imprisonment, okay? And if you're in the state system and every six years you stand for election or you stand for retention, uh, Madison understood that there could be a great deal of local pressure. So he felt, and ultimately um, the, the founders felt, that it was important for federal judges to be independent of that. Okay? Not only are they independent agents from an ideological standpoint, but um, they should be protected from, uh, from threats or pressures of, uh, of local, whether it be the electorate or, uh, or legislators or presidents or, or governors. Um, in other words, the independence of the judiciary was very important. Now we have, in the United States, we have about three different systems, okay? So the federal system, when you're appointed, you're appointed for a lifetime. Uh, and the only way that you can re be removed is by committing a felony for bad behavior, uh, essentially. Um, but you're independent as far as what type of judicial pronouncements that, that you may make. Now, in the state system, you have essentially two different systems, okay? One is what's called the Missouri Plan, and that's what Nebraska has. And in the Missouri plan, if there's an opening for a judgeship, um, like when I was uh, applying in 1995, um, there are individuals that are, are lawyers, um, or they could be judges that are applying for a state judicial job, okay? And you have to go in front of an independent commission. That's the, that's the Missouri plan uh, that made up of eight people, four lay people and four lawyers. Uh, four Republicans and four Democrats, okay? Um, or they can be independents, they cannot be of, of one party. But the idea behind that is that's a merit plan. In other words, they will take the applications and they will do live interviews, you make a presentation uh, before them. Uh, in that commission, you have to have at least five votes to get out of that commission. And let's say there's eight or nine people that will apply, uh, they send forward to the governor those names that are sufficiently qualified for that position, whether it's a district judgeship or a Supreme Court judgeship, whatever it may be. Um, so they will send three or four names to the governor, and then the governor makes the appointment from there. So as you can see, it's kind of a combined uh, system. It, it's a merit plan in that you have to go through the commission and get out of the commission first, and then the governor will make the appointment from there. And hopefully the governor makes his or her appointments based on merit also and not based on what political party you may be. But there is some politics involved in the, uh, in the state judicial uh, system. And then every six years after that, it's actually three years after you're first uh, appointed, but every six years after that, you stand for retention. Okay, and the retention vote, and most all of you have probably filled out a ballot so far, and it, and it would say, uh, shall you retain? Uh, Chief Justice Michael Havikin, yes or no? I mean, it's, it's a straight up yes or straight up no. Um, now, by and large, the Missouri plan works pretty well. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a combination, uh, you know, in the, in the federal system, you have all kinds of independence over here, all right? What kind of accountability do you have? 
not much. Okay, once the president appoints you, uh, you better hope you have a good judge because there's not a lot of accountability. Okay, on if you're an elected judge, as many other states have, we'll talk about that in a minute. All right, you have all kinds of accountability because you're elected every four or six years. Okay, but what type of independence do you have? Not a whole lot. I mean, judges would say that they're independent, but there's all kinds of pressure being put on by, um, by MAD, for example, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, or um, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, or um, whether you've imposed the death penalty or not. There's all kinds of pressures that go, uh, go about on, a, on elected systems. So there you have all kinds of accountability, not much independence. The idea behind the Missouri plan is that you do have a fair amount of independence because of the system that was imposed and there is some accountability uh, at the same time. Um, now the problem with the Missouri, if you do not have complete independence, um, it, it can become a problem. Um, for example, how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the Iowa case, the, the same-sex marriage case that occurred about eight years ago? Many of you, okay, two of you are. Uh, many of you are probably too, too young for that, but Okay, Iowa had the same system uh, that we did, uh, the state of Nebraska. It had a Missouri plan system, uh, and the case's name was Varnum versus uh, Breen, and it was the very, now I think all of you are aware of the recent uh, Oberfell versus Hodges, the Supreme Court case in June of 2015, are you not, where equality of marriage was declared to be the law of the land? Okay, well, Iowa had the very same question posed uh, under the Iowa state constitution. Okay? And what the Iowa Supreme Court found unanimously was that under the Iowa constitution, both under the due process clause and under the equal protection clause, um, that there should be equality in marriage. Okay? That same-sex marriage, uh, that it was unconstitutional to prohibit same-sex marriage under both of those clauses. Well, in a year and a half later, Three of the judges of the Iowa Supreme Court stood for retention. I knew two of them very well, um, excellent judges. And remember, that case was a unanimous case. And those three judges that stood for retention in November of 2010 were not retained, okay? Based on that case, uh, primarily, I mean, they were outstanding judges in every other respect. I would say they were outstanding judges in that respect also, but uh, they were not retained. And, and so the Missouri plan is by far not a perfect system because if you have a controversial case, let's say you have a controversial death penalty case or same-sex marriage case or an abortion case, and it happens to have occurred in the year or two prior to the time that you stand for retention election, um, you don't feel real independent at, at that point in time. Um, so it's, it's very important to understand the context. Um, and the third system that I... Uh, indicated was an elective system. And many of the states in the, in the southern United States, Louisiana and Texas and Alabama, but even states like uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin have elections uh, for their judges. Um, now I think that is the most problematical of, of all. I, there are 60 minute stories and stuff that, uh, that have been broadcast where you have Texas elections where you'll have a trial judge that has the two lawyers, one representing the plaintiff and one representing the defendant, he'll be calling them up prior to trial to see who's made donations to, the, uh, uh, to his or her campaign uh, right prior to trial. Now, if you're sitting with the lawyer that did not make a donation to that particular judge, are, are you feeling real good about your chances at trial? Not, uh, not necessarily. And so um, <clears throat> the elective system uh, is problematical in, uh, in, in many, many ways. Um, so anyway, we have the federal system where there are uh, lifetime appointments. You have the Missouri plan, um, which approximately 14 or 15 states have. And then uh, you have the elective system, which uh, actually about 27 or 28 states at my last county uh, still has uh, an elective plan. Now, so let's talk about the federal system for, for a moment. Um, how's it working? Okay. Uh, we have... Article 2, Section 2 of the uh, United States Constitution that says the president 
shall appoint uh, those judges that are members of the United States Supreme Court and all other lower court judges, all right, with the advice and the consent of the Senate, all right? That's all it says. That's called the advice and consent clause. Well, it's a fairly innocuous clause, and what, what the founders uh, meant by that was that the, uh, the president, when, when you win the presidency, to the winner goes the spoils. In, in other words, you're going to nominate judges, not necessarily that are going to think like you or, or be like you, but you have the right to nominate judges um, that that you are comfortable with, that you will interview, that you look at their judicial past, and that you are comfortable appointing them. And the Senate then has advice and consent function, okay? And in the old days, and when I talk about the old days, I'm only talking about 10 years ago or so, eight, eight to 10 years ago. It used to be for a federal district judge like me, or for a court of appeals judge, uh, there wasn't a lot of controversy. In other words, the two senators in your state would send forth your name to the president of the United States, the president or his, his or her, um, w within their staff, the Office of uh, Judicial Counsel would interview you, and then the president would make the, uh, the nomination. Once the president makes the nomination, then you go before what's called the Senate Judiciary Committee. Okay. The Senate Judiciary Committee is made up of 16 senators, um, and it's roughly um, uh, 11 senators from, well, it's nine senators from one side, seven senators from, from the other side, depending who has the majority party. Okay. Um, but in the past, it didn't make a lot of difference who was in the majority party. Um, they would review your background. You would go and answer questions before the United States Senate. Uh, and they would send forth your, your name. And unless there was something terribly controversial in your background, your name would go forward, and the, uh, and the Senate would then vote up or down within days uh, of your nomination um, whether, uh, whether or not you would be confirmed. Okay? And that held forth for years and years, uh, up until about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Now the system is your name is still set forth, by the United States Senators. For example, my name was uh, set forth by Senator Nelson and Senator Johans, one Democrat and one Republican. Uh, president Barack Obama was the president at that time. Uh, that was 2011 when, when he nominated me. I went before and had my Senate Judiciary uh, Committee meeting in September. That I, I was nominated in May. It used to be uh, it would take the Senate Judiciary Committee maybe six weeks or eight weeks to vet you, to do your background check, and then you would have your, uh, your Senate Judiciary uh, hearing, and then within days after that, you would be confirmed. Um, my nomination went before them, and mine was relatively non-controversial at the time, or I thought it was, and uh, I had my hearing in September. I was not voted upon until January, um, and that's just because at that time, the Republicans held it up, but now it's the Democrats that are holding it up. I'm, I'm not assessing blame to either one of the parties. Both parties are, are participating in that, okay? Um, and, and so one asked the question, how is the vetting process or how is the advice and consent process going? I imagine most all of you are familiar with the recent nomination of uh, Judge Neil Gorsuch to the United States Supreme Court, and he was just sworn in as Justice Neil Gorsuch this, uh, this past week. Are, are all of you familiar with that nomination? Okay. All right. He was nominated by, by President Trump. Now, ironically, United States Supreme Court justices, they go to the top of the list. So they get vetted within uh, approximately six to eight weeks. They have their Senate Judiciary hearing. Which, which he had um, about three weeks ago, and then his vote was on April 7th. Okay, so that moves along fairly quickly. But what happened in that particular nomination was that the uh, Republican Party was forced to utilize what's called the nuclear option. Does anybody know what the nuclear option is in, in this particular case? Anybody know? Okay, give it a shot. Exactly. It used to be that um, one of the parties 
could filibuster, could impose cloture, and it would take 60 votes to move that nomination forward. Now, for a United States Supreme Court nominee, do you think that's a good idea? Anybody? It may be, it may not. I, I, I'm just interested in your thought. What do you think? Do you think, do you think having a filibuster opportunity is a good idea for, uh, for a United States Supreme Court nominee? Does anybody think it's in the Constitution? No. Yeah. No, here, I'll read you Article 2. Article 2, Section 2 says, The President shall have the uh, power to appoint members of the Supreme Court or all other officers of the United States, okay, and they shall be uh, appointed upon advice and consent of the Senate. That's, that's all it says, okay? Now, the idea behind the filibuster, behind cloture, is that, okay, we're not going to have extreme nominees. Okay, so if, if the Republican Party's in power and, and they're up 52 to 48 in the Senate or the uh, Democratic Party is up, you know, 53 to 47 or whatever, you can't have an extremely conservative or an extremely liberal uh, candidate. That's why you would have to pass the 60 vote mark. But the problem is the Senate has become dysfunctional within the last four to six to, to eight years. And so they're invoking cloture on everyone, okay? Regardless of what anybody thinks about um, Neil Gorsuch, he is a highly qualified candidate. He has served on the uh, United States Court of Appeals in the, in the Tenth Circuit. Um, he would be within the main, you not, might not agree with all of his decisions, either from the right side or the left side, but he is certainly within the mainstream. He is the type of individual that the Senate 10, 15 years ago would have had no problems uh, confirming. And Neil Gorsuch couldn't get any more than 52 to 54 votes to invoke cloture in this particular case, okay? And so the Senate, uh, which was controlled by the Republicans at this point in time, said, we're gonna change the rules. It's not in the Constitution, so it's up to the Senate to set the filibuster rules, okay? And what the Senate had done, you know, I think it was two years ago now, they invoked the nuclear option as far as Court of Appeals judges and District Court judges, because at that time the Republicans were holding up the Democrats, okay? And they were not allowing names to go through on many, many uh, United States Court of Appeals and District Court uh, judges. So they invoked the nuclear option as far as any judges lower than the United States Supreme Court but you still had to get the 60 votes if you were a United States Supreme Court nominee. Well, just within the last two weeks, then the Senate went nuclear on United States Supreme Court nominees, okay? So now, as long as you have 51 votes, you will be confirmed by the Senate. Do people think that's a good idea? I mean, should it be 52 to 48, or should you have to get 60 to 40 or above to be if, if the Senate's function is advice and consent. Anybody have a thought on that? Good idea, bad idea? Okay. Well, I'm the one getting paid to lecture, and you know how much I'm getting paid? Zippo, but that's okay. <laughs> but, no, I think, I think in, for the United States Senate and the advice and consent uh, function, function I, I do not believe there should be a filibuster. I really don't. I, I think Filibusters are okay if they are used for the right purpose. In other words, the purpose for the filibuster was to prevent extreme candidates, and I think that's an appropriate function to have, but that's not the way the Senate was using it. Doesn't matter whether it's from the Republican side or the Democratic side, it was being utilized for every uh, nominee that was, that was coming forward, and every nominee, regardless of how qualified they were, um, was getting filibustered. So, uh, I think at this point in time, until the Senate learns to behave themselves, and maybe, and, and I'm really depending on your generation, okay? I think it's your generation that is going to say, this is baloney. This is the baloney, the way the government is working, and that we're filibustering every piece of legislation, or Supreme Court nominees, or other nominees, and at some point in time, I think the filibuster has its appropriate place 
within the United States Senate, but it is being abused at this point in time. And take a look and watch. Uh, the filibuster is still alive and well uh, as far as legislating, but that's, that's the next step, okay? The next step is, is going to be, whether it be the Republican Party or the Democratic Party in, in power, is going to take a look at the filibuster and, and say, you know what, we shouldn't have to have 60 votes on simple, straightforward legislation, okay? Now, I hope to heck the filibuster remains, because I think it's an important uh, legislative tool for, tool for the minority party. So I hope it stays in place for legislative matters. And honestly, I think it would be appropriate, even in judicial matters, if it was used appropriately. But that, that's the next step that you're going to have to take a look at. It. So that's, that's my two cents worth as far as how it's working. So the, the Senate has gone nuclear on all uh, United States federal judgeship uh, nominees. And with the way the Senate is working at this point in time, I think that's proper. I, I think it's appropriate, okay? Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the Nebraska federal judiciary, but before I do that, anybody have any questions about uh, the, the state of the federal judiciary overall? And I'll answer some questions about the United States Supreme Court later when we have a question and answer period. All right. Now, on the uh, state of the federal judiciary locally, uh, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of statistics. I'm, I'm just going to tell you a little bit. Uh, I'm going to give you a context of the way the federal system works uh, in the state of Nebraska and, na and nationwide, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on in Nebraska. Um, now, Article Three of the uh, United States Constitution, as I told you before, creates the Supreme Court, all right? Uh, and the Supreme Court, I'm just going to tell you about the three levels very briefly. The Supreme Court uh, actually does have original trial uh, jurisdiction in some cases, and that's controversies between states, okay? Some of you may be familiar with Kansas versus Nebraska when we're fighting over the Republican River and what, which irrigators get to use water from the Republican River. The United States Supreme Court appoints a master uh, to hear the facts in that case, and they actually are a trial court in cases like that. But by and large, the uh, Supreme Court, which you're all familiar with, has appellate jurisdiction of all other cases uh, within the jurisdiction created by Article III. Uh, now, below the Supreme Court are 12 geographical units, and they're called the Circuit Courts of Appeal. Okay? There's 11 of them primarily. That we're in the Eighth Circuit. Okay, and the Eighth Circuit is made up of the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, and Arkansas. We are the uh, Eighth Circuit. So those federal district courts that are within that circuit, uh, then if you appeal a case within the Eighth Circuit, um, you will do it. It's either in St. Louis or St. Paul primarily are the courthouses that uh, you'll argue your case. Okay, and there are 10 other uh, circuits. So the Ninth Circuit is in... Uh, California and, and Hawaii and Washington, Oregon, out on, the, out on the West Coast. And there are 11 circuit courts, and then there's the circuit court of the uh, District of Columbia. Uh, and so those are the courts that will hear your appeals from the federal district court. Now, each state has at least one federal district court, okay? And Nebraska has one central district court. I'm located, located here in Lincoln, okay? There are three active district judges. Two of them are in Omaha, and one is in, in Lincoln. And my courthouse is straight south of you, about three and a half blocks. If you go to, uh, to 15th or, uh, or 16th and O, uh, up on the fifth, uh, fifth floor, that's where my court uh, is. And I welcome you to come visit at any time, but come visit. Don't, don't be there for any other reason, okay? So, I, I have had a couple of university students that I really didn't want to, uh, to be there, but, uh, but come visit me uh, sometimes. And there are, there are 94 uh, judicial districts um, throughout all the states. So some of the larger states, like California, has the, you know, the Eastern District of California, the Northern District, Southern District, and Central District. I mean, it, it's just a larger jurisdiction. Uh, so they have uh, several, but Nebraska uh, has one. Um, and the district courts are the courts of general jurisdiction, and that's where uh, all civil and criminal cases are tried. So I'm a trial uh, court judge at that point. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to talk to you just briefly about the difference between uh, civil jurisdiction and federal jurisdiction. The, uh, 
a litigant may bring a lawsuit in the federal district court in three situations. Number one, where diversity jurisdiction is involved. So if you are suing or being sued by somebody from a different state and your case involves more than $75,000, you can remove it from the state district court to the federal court. Why would somebody want to do that? Any thoughts about that? Why would you want to remove it to the federal court? What if you lived in California okay, and you rented a car and you were going to take a trip across I-80 and you're taking your trip across I-80 and you happen to be involved in an automobile accident, a bad automobile accident in which somebody was severely injured in Wood River, Nebraska. Okay, Everybody know where Wood River is out on the, on the interstate? Okay. Um, it's over by Grand Island. It's a little bit west of Grand Island, okay? Now, if you were from California, would you want to go in to the district court of Hall County and have your case tried to local jurors there in Wood River or Grand Island? Uh-uh, no. So that's why, that's why there's diversity jurisdiction, okay? So if you are either suing or being sued, and it's against somebody that's local and you don't want to you don't want to go into Saline County District Court if you live in Nevada or or California you can remove it to the to the federal district court so so we have a lot of those cases okay of either corporations or parties that are from two different states okay that's uh, that's diversity jurisdiction uh, and then also uh, we have cases where the federal question jurisdiction exists let's say for example under the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, okay? If it's an act that created, it's a federal, federally created uh, law, then you would bring that suit in the, uh, in the federal district court uh, or where the United States is a party, okay? If you're suing the United States on, on a Clean Water Act or whatever the case may be, uh, then, then you would come to the, uh, to the federal courts, all right? Now, uh, Nebraska is a busy district, okay? We... Uh, we have the eighth highest per judge criminal felony caseload uh, in the country. Uh, our caseload uh, exceeds those districts that include the metropolitan areas of like Chicago, uh, Detroit, Los Angeles, or New York City as, as far as a per judge uh, caseload. The uh, average federal judge um, throughout the country handles about 104 criminal cases Per year in Nebraska, we each handle um, in excess of 190. Last year it was 191 uh, federal criminal cases. Um, Nebraska is among the eight states uh, that has a single federal district and only three authorized judgeships. Okay, so those would be uh, states the size of like uh, Idaho or Montana and places like that. Um, and for the 12-month period ending last September 30th, Nebraska, Nebraska listed uh, was ranked first amongst those districts in its per-judge weighted case filings and felony caseload. Um, so, so we're a busy district. Um, last year, uh, we had uh, 1,642 cases on file. Um, that's a per-judge uh, case filing of uh, 547 cases that we handle in any particular year. 254 of those are civil cases, um, several of which go to trial, and 191 of those are, uh, are, are criminal cases. A number of those also go to trial. Um, so we don't, we don't sit around and, uh, and sleep during the day while we're, uh, while we're judging uh, over there. Uh, just as far as an idea of what types of cases uh, we have, I, I pulled up from 2015, 2016, uh, about 51% of our cases are federal drug cases, okay? And I'll talk to you about the, those in a minute. 10% uh, uh, are immigration cases. A lot of people are surprised how many immigration cases we have in Nebraska. Um, many of them come from packing plant areas like Madison County, you know, whether it's in Norfolk or Grand Island, uh, Lexington, uh, South Sioux, but we have a, a lot of other types of immigration cases that I can talk to you about. Uh, about 10% of them are firearms or explosives, 6% um, uh, violent crimes, 8% sex offenses. We have a number of child pornography cases that we do in the federal system, and the state system does also. Uh, so those are the type of, uh, those are the type of cases uh, that, we, uh, that we handle. In addition to that, we supervise our probation office. Uh, when somebody is um, not just placed on probation, but 
if somebody is given, uh, let's say, a four-year sentence in a federal penitentiary, they have what's called supervised release afterwards. They may have three or four years of supervised release. Our probation office uh, handles those type of cases. And we had, last year we had over 1,200 cases under supervision uh, last year. Um, and so uh, our probation office is a very, very busy district uh, also. Okay? So that gives you an idea of, of what we do in the daytime here in, uh, here in Nebraska. Now, as far as the future is concerned, um, I, don't have a, I don't have a crystal ball, so I'll just give you uh, some of my, my thoughts. I, I think our civil filings, uh, they've remained relatively steady uh, throughout the last three or four years. They haven't gone up a, a great deal, haven't gone down, uh, and I would anticipate uh, that will stay about the same. With the new administration, um, the Trump administration, with uh, uh, Attorney General Sessions uh, at the helm, uh, there have been indications that the quote-unquote war on drugs is going to increase, so I would anticipate we're going to see uh, more drug cases uh, than we have. I'm not sure how we're going to do that. We see a hell of a lot of them right now, but anyway, I do anticipate that we're, uh, we're going to see a few more drug cases. Uh, immigration cases, I would guess, are going to be on the increase. Um, and uh, uh, again, we see a number of those. Probably the primary difference there, right now the immigration cases we see are those. If, if somebody is, primarily what we see on a criminal basis is if somebody has been removed from the country before, it's called illegal reentry, okay? And what we see is primarily those that have committed crimes, okay? They've committed a crime in the state of Nebraska, so they come before the federal court uh, with an illegal reentry. Um, now, it is still illegal under the federal law to reenter after you have been deported uh, at least one other time. Um, and I would guess we're gonna see an increase in that. We'll see not only those that have just pick, been picked up for either a state or federal crime, um, but maybe picked up for, for other reasons. And my guess is we're going to see an increase uh, in immigration cases. On fraud and white collar uh, crimes, I'm not sure. The Obama administration was, uh, uh, was pretty assertive in, in that area, and I would guess the Trump administration is going to remain assertive in that area. Um, I, I don't anticipate we'll see an increase significantly, but we're certainly not going to see a decrease in that area. So I, I anticipate that our our federal criminal cases are going to go up uh, somewhat, um, maybe a lot, we'll see. Uh, and a lot of it depends on who the local United States attorney is going to be. And that's the last thing I'll talk to you about. There are three nominations that will be pending. One is the United States attorney, and again, that's a presidential appointment confirmed by the Senate. Okay. And that will probably be coming forth, I would guess, within the next month or two. And hopefully we'll have a confirmation by the Senate uh, in, in August or so. But right now we don't have a United States attorney. I mean, we have the deputy United States attorney and we have all of our assistants. So things are moving forward, but we do not have a United States attorney in the District of Nebraska. Uh, a United States marshal will be nominated also and confirmed by the Senate. And we have one opening in the judiciary uh, the chief judge of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals was our own Bill Riley uh, from Omaha, and he announced he, he took senior status uh, as of uh, the latter part of March, March 31, and so we have an opening in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and so there will be a presidential nomination, I would guess again, hopefully by May or so, and then that poor soul is going to have to go through <laughs> the Senate confirmation process and, and, uh, and will be confirmed by the Senate. Um, I, again, I hope we get back a little closer to the old days where it's a six-month process rather than an 11- or 12-month process, but, uh, but we shall see. Okay? All righty, let's, uh, let's take a few questions. If anybody has uh, questions, I'm ha happy to answer them. If not, we'll go over and... Drink punch and eat cookies. Anybody? Yes. I don't know if that, I don't know if uh, Chris wants you to use mic or not. So. Thank you. Um, in light of say uh, the the court case of Booker, where sentencing guidelines are no longer mandatory, could you talk about if 
how your use of sentencing guidelines, if you still use them, and how they work into your decision making, particularly in criminal cases? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. And uh, uh, yeah, Booker was decided about 10 years ago. It was in two, a little over 10 years ago. It was in 2006. The federal sentencing guidelines came in in 1987. Uh, and, the, and the guidelines were meant at that time and after Booker are designed, they are to be advisory in nature, okay? So drug crimes, for example, if, if you had a certain quantity, if you brought in a significant, if you were selling a significant amount of, of drugs, if you had a certain prior criminal history, you would, you would get points for all of that, okay? And so in each case, let's say it's a drug case that, that you're asked about, I will have a guideline range of, let's say I would have a case that says uh, because of the amount of drugs that you brought in, your prior criminal history, et cetera, your range is 87 to 108 months, okay? That's, um, and that's based on a whole bunch of sentencing statistics throughout the nation. What I do and what our judges in our district do is use that as a, as a starting point, okay? And if a case is basically in the heartland of the, uh, of the guideline, in other words, if this person did have a significant criminal history, uh, has a significant problem with, with drugs that is, that's going to be addressed in, in prison, et cetera, and there aren't unusual circumstances, you're likely to stay roughly within the guidelines, okay? Um, but you do not need to, okay? There are certain types of cases in which, you know, somebody might have a criminal history uh, point usage of three levels, okay? Uh, but you look at their prior record and somebody has been abusing drugs, uh, and so they've got two DUIs, okay? And one $100 possession of, of marijuana, all right? And, and a shoplifting, okay? Because they were using drugs, et cetera. Hey, this isn't exactly your top of the line dangerous criminal, okay? But I mean, they might have a, a level three dangerousness in criminal, and you compare it to somebody who's been out doing two burglaries and, a, and thefts other than that, those aren't equal, okay? And so I'm an old probation officer, so I used to look at criminal histories and predictability of whether somebody's likely to offend again, whether somebody's a danger to the community. That's the type of things that I look at, okay? And that's where I start, okay? Now, a lot of times, the sentencing guidelines will fit within, I, I would say probably 50 to 60% of the time, the sentencing guidelines are what I would do anyway, okay? Um, so, I mean, I, I might pronounce an 87-month sentence in that case, but I'd pronounce it because this person has had, you know, was selling for a long time, significant amount of drugs, uh, was, a, was a part of a major conspiracy, had a significant prior history without any type of guidelines I might look at that and say that's 87 or 90 months or 96 months or whatever the case may be. It would fit within the guidelines. But now what I can do is vary downward or upward, okay, in a, in a case if the, if the sentence doesn't make sense within the guidelines, okay? And so it gives sentencing judges uh, a, a lot more leeway than it, than it used to. But the guidelines still serve a purpose. I mean, the reason the guidelines were placed in is You'd have federal drug offenders, and, and somebody would have a drug offense with the very same criminal history, and they would come from the Eastern District of New York, and you know, and they all talk to each other in federal prison, and uh, this guy gets two years, and somebody we sentence here in Nebraska or Texas gets eight years, okay, for the very same crime, the very same offense, have the same prior record, and in Congress said at some point in time, these type of disparities we're not going to put up with. Okay, so we're going to have at least guidelines that, that you should follow. And initially what happened is those guidelines were just rigid. I mean, you, you could not sentence outside of them, either upwards or downwards, and that didn't make any sense. I mean, there were all kinds of cases in, in, in which it didn't make sense. Um, so uh, guidelines are, are just that. They are guidelines, they're advisory, um, but I use them just in the, I always match it up with, with my own criteria, and that is what, what type of offense was it, what type of person was this, both good and bad, okay, what type of criminal history did they have, 
what's the predictability of, of future crime and are they danger to, to society? I had a case that was fairly well publicized, um, a couple of them actually. Um, you know, that's the issue I have with mandatory minimums also. Um, I had a case that I tried two years ago over in, in Omaha, uh, and it was a young lady that was the tail end of a conspiracy. A lot of these conspiracy cases are horrendous. We, we had a, a conspiracy that came out of Mexico through California to Nebraska, and they were selling tons of meth, okay? And there were three people at the top of the conspiracy okay, that received significant sentences, okay? 25 to 30 year sentences, and, and they should have. I mean, they, they were selling lots of drugs to lots of people in, in bad circumstances, et cetera. Then down on the low end of the conspiracy, I ended up trying a case of the person that was at the hind end, and what she did was she rented her house to somebody that, that was a low end mule in this drug conspiracy, and on two occasions she had kept books for that person. So. Did she know what was going on? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, she had no idea what, this, what the main portion of the conspiracy was, but did she know there were, there were drugs being sold up in northeast Nebraska? Yes. And did she participate? Yes, a little bit. So she was found guilty by a, uh, by a jury um, of conspiracy, and it was more than the 10-year mandatory minimum. I mean, she was caught in this conspiracy, and she was the tail end of it, so she was found guilty of the offense, but because she was part of the conspiracy, she was held to the entire drug amount, the quantity amount, um, and it was a 10-year mandatory minimum, and it's a sentence like that that is just ridiculous. I mean, it takes away the discretion of, of federal trial judges. Now, did she know what was going on? Was she part of that conspiracy in selling drugs? Yes, and should have she gone to prison? Yes, probably, for whatever period of time, maybe 18 months, maybe two years, or whatever the case would, uh, would be, but that is not a 10-year mandatory minimum. So she left a five-year-old and a three-year-old at home. She was one semester away from graduating as a nurse up in uh, northeast Nebraska, and she is now serving 10 years in a federal prison. Um, is that justice? Let, let's talk to our senators some, someday, okay? So, all right, thank you. As the rest yep. of the group is thinking, I have a simple one for you, but help us out. How many senior judges are there in the state of Nebraska and the district? And explain to us a little bit what a senior judge is. Yeah, there are two senior judges. Uh, one is uh, Judge Cup, who's here in uh, Lincoln. The other one is Judge, no, there are three senior judges, Judge Battalion and Judge Strom over in Omaha. Um, and a senior judge is once, once you've reached retirement age, as a, it, it's called the rule of 80. If you've served, if you're at least age 65 and have served 15 years in the federal judiciary, uh, then you can take what's called senior status. And if you take uh, more than a 25% caseload, and many of them take, our senior judges take anywhere from an 80% to 100% uh, caseload, um, but you can stay on the judiciary with uh, with full staff, and, and it's a lifetime pay anyway, so it's really kind of a volunteer position. I mean, you're gonna be paid whatever during, their, during your lifetime, but our senior judges have been very good about coming out, coming back, and helping with both the criminal and the civil caseload. But once you get senior status, you have more freedom. You do not have to take a 100% caseload. You know, you could take a 50% caseload, say for example, or you could take only civil cases and not criminal cases. But, um, but the senior system is a, a very good system in the federal judiciary. I mean, we rely upon our senior judges to help us out with our caseload. Um, the caseload statistics that I read to you would be even worse if we didn't have, if we didn't have senior judges helping us out, so, okay? Thank you. I think that young man right in front of you had a question. Or did you, yep. Do you consider prison overcrowding when you do sentence guidelines? Yeah, I do not. Um, I, I mean, I do to the extent, you always consider what are the alternatives to sentencing. I, I mean, I don't start out in a case and say, everybody in the world has to go to prison, okay? I mean, I look at, 
I look at all kinds of sentencing alternatives, okay? But there are a number of individuals because of the type of crime they committed, because of their background, because of dangerousness to society, um, you know, a prison sentence is imposed. And if I determine that a prison sentence should be imposed in a particular case, um, I don't consider prison overcrowding, okay? Now, the federal system does not have the same problem as the state system in, in prison overcrowding. Um, but the state system does have a real problem at, at this point in time. And uh, I mean, that, that should be addressed by both branches of government, by the legislative and the judicial branch, as far as providing more alternatives to incarceration, particularly like for drug offenses or nonviolent offenses. I, you know, is there over-incarceration in the United States? Yes, okay, particularly for those type of offenses. But, but that's a legislative and a judicial solution that must be handled together, okay? All righty, yeah. Yes. Uh, sir, do you think that Attorney General Sessions' approach to the war on drugs works? I don't know. I don't know what his approach is yet. The yeah. higher, higher sentencing, um, cracking down on marijuana more, stuff like that. Yeah. What do you think? Has, has it worked in the last uh, 15 or 20 years? <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a combination of things that, that has to be done and it, and it has to be done legislatively. I mean, what the attorney, the attorney general can only do so much. I mean, he or she is the prosecutor, okay? And so that, that's what their role or function is. I, I think legislatively, and, and that's been a debate for how many years, Chris? Thir 30, 40 years as far as what, what is the right approach to, to the war on drugs. I mean, we've tried incarceration to the max. I can tell you that, that doesn't do it. Um, you know, we've tried both federal and state drug programs. Uh, those are helpful, but those are not the ultimate answer. Um, I honestly think that, there is, that, that there's some combination there. The, the problem is we over-categorize. Okay, so I mean, if we have the, if we have the war on drug, we end up doing you know ten year mandatory minimums, no matter what what the case is, um, or we have judicial guidelines in certain offenses that are just horrendous, you know, and uh, and that isn't particularly the case. By the same token, there are many states that do very little or nothing as far as drug rehab, and um, at least the federal system, we have a program. It's a it's a, a five hundred hour intensive, it takes a, a number of months, it's called RNAP, um, and, and that has really been helpful and really been successful in people coming out of prison and not reoffending. And, and that's what you want. I mean, even if you impose a sentence, whatever it is, I mean, you want them not to reoffend when, when they get out. So if, uh, if drugs are the issue, then you treat drugs. Oftentimes we have mental health, we have co-occurring, we have mental health and uh, drug addiction. Um, and if you don't address them both, you've got a problem. So, so I would say it's a combination of the, of the two. But finding that sweet spot, yowza. Okay. Yes, yeah. Kind of block the pressures and make a rational choice in sentence. Okay, that's a that that's a good question. I look at I look at every individual case as an individual. Okay, I started doing that when I was a probation officer and on through. So as opposed to looking at the guidelines, you know, and taking a book and saying this person, Joe Schmo, fits within the guideline, I always take a look at the individual first. Okay, what have they done? You know, for example, many of them have, are on pretrial release uh, during the interim period of time. Maybe in the six months between the time they're arrested and before they come to me on sentencing, I take a look at what they do, okay? So if they've, if they've been in drug rehab since then, you know, they've got a job that pays them $20 an hour, and the, those things make a difference to me, okay? So, I mean, I take a look at the, 
at the individual and what their history and what their char characteristics are first, uh, and then I look at, at the offense and, uh, and whether incarceration is needed or not. So, okay, so I try to keep it both objective and subjective, but, but I, don't look at, I don't look at somebody coming before me as Joe Schmo, he had this much in drugs, he has this criminal offense, this history, therefore, my calculator says he gets 60 months. Okay, I don't do that. Okay, so I look at individuals. Okay. All right. Well, you've been great. Do I get any extra credit, Professor? <laughs> well, here's an extra credit question. All right. I thought someone Give them two points on this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually warned the judge in advance to expect that obviously there's an immigration matter that went before a federal judge. Could you please explain to us why is it that a federal judge can review, in the case of immigration, overturn a federal executive order coming from the president? Well, that's a good question. That's probably going to come before the Supreme Court at some point in time. But what, what that particular federal court said, I mean, the reason it comes before a federal judge is somebody is claiming that a provision of the Constitution was, uh, was violated. And the two provisions in, that, in the initial case, okay, there were two provisions. One was the Due Process Clause, uh, and the, uh, the second was the First Amendment, um, the, the Religious Clause, the Religion Clause, okay? And uh, in, in that particular case, the federal judge found both were, were violated, okay? That somebody that hopped on a plane in, um, well, let, let just, let's just use it again, somebody that hopped on a plane in Syria, okay? and they were maybe coming back to see their family or whatever, and they weren't told that the immigration order was in effect, and they land in New York or Washington, Dulles, and they're taken off the plane and, and saying they're being sent back. They're, what the federal court found was you did not have adequate due process, okay? You didn't have an opportunity to be, to be heard uh, and prior to detention, et cetera. And then secondly, the federal court in that, and it was primarily the due process clause in that case. Now, in these later cases, it's the religion clause of the First Amendment that was, that was violated, okay? And that will, that will go up to the Ninth Circuit, and I would guess ultimately to the United States Supreme Court. But your question is, how, to, how does some federal judge, how are they able to overturn the pronouncement of a, of a president or somebody in the executive branch? Uh, the only way that they can is not because... I feel like it's right or wrong, but you know, was some provision of the United States Constitution violated? Okay, and we have three sections, so you get full extra credit here. We have we have three sections of the Constitution. Article one is is what Congress can do. Article two is what the executive branch can do, the President of the United States or the Attorney General, and Article three is the judicial branch. Okay, and the Constitution set up a very neat checks and balances, and it has worked for uh, well over 200 years. Um, but that's, that's why a federal judge can review either what Congress did or what the president did. But a federal judge can only review it in the sense that you violate the Constitution. Not, do I agree with you? Do I think it's a good idea? If I were king, here's what I'd do. None of those things fly. But if it violates the... Uh, the Constitution, then the uh, then, then a federal judge can issue an order barring that particular, you know, whether it's an act of Congress or an act of the president. Now that doesn't mean that the president can't adjust, just as they did in this particular case, or that Congress can't fix the law, but they have to do it in a way that's constitutional. Does that answer your question? Perfect. All right. Well, you've been great. So, uh, anybody else? Uh, have any questions? If not, we'll let you get back and enjoy cookies or the weather or prepare for final exams, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.